or women's rights or farmers' rights or workers' rights. There are strong, committed interest groups which stand up for these rights. They may have more or less political influence. And I'm not going into that, but at least it's a visible, clear cut group. Maybe only some part of that group get organized publicly, but there is a committed public interest group. Which is the public interest group for them? And interestingly, <clears throat> the two constituencies which would have been expected to be most concerned about health, that is, doctors and health workers and patients, for different reasons, are rather unsuitable to take up health in the public. <laughs> Maybe I'm letting, making a politically uh, inappropriate statement, but by and large, they don't lend themselves to being the leaders of, you know, in, in almost any country across the world, with a few rare exceptions, like people living in the same way. With a few exceptions, by and large, these two important groups don't stand up for health or don't need health focus. The healthy are unwilling to mobilize for health, and the sick are incapable of mobilizing. So who, who, who mobilizes on health? Who converts health into a political health? This is a question which I'm posing to you. And I, of course, we have been struggling with this issue. Uh, but coming to the report itself, uh, with all these, uh, with this bit of background, um, it's a uh, reasonably comprehensive report. It has dealt with a certain level of the dynamics related to uh, how people relate with health in the context of elections. And that is a, it's a good step forward. But I have a few uh, critical comments. First of all, it's a purely quantitative survey. One would have liked to also have a qualitative component to this study. And I know it's, it's more demanding, it's, it takes more time, <laughs> it's more difficult to analyze and all that. But if you want to know not only what people are broadly thinking, but why they are thinking that way, we have to get into focus of discussion, we have to get into in depth interviews. And I think I also not just let us say ordinary people on the ground, but also multiple stakeholders. So health activists, public health professionals, healthcare workers, and so on. And also ground level political representatives like panchayat members, how do they look at health? It would have been very interesting to have some in-depth interviews and qualitative information from a wider range of stakeholders. That would have been a good value addition. Secondly, when we talk about schemes like uh, PMJY, a health insurance scheme, now, the number of people in a village who would have availed, actually availed of PMJY will be a small handful. <clears throat> and we had just two villages per district. You know? So maybe 50 respondents. In 50 respondents, to get meaningful information about PMJY, it's not that much. You'll have to actually interview specifically people who have either availed of PMJY or who could not have availed of PMJY to get some in depth understanding of what is people's actual perception about. So I'm just giving a few uh, issues. And then there's a big confounder, which I did not see getting clearly at this. People who vote for an opposition party vote for that party for larger political And they have a perception about the ruling party for a range of reasons, which may color their perception also about themselves. So if I support an opposition party, I'm more likely to say that mere am or health, health center kicks in each other, so that kicks in each other. And if I'm a member or I'm a supporter of the ruling party, I'm more likely to say that no, our health centers are working well. Whether or whether or not they're actually working well becomes a big second, is a big confounder. So whether people said that, you know, you get protected like this. So we have to take care of these confounders, otherwise, there's a big risk that we may be making some wrong accusation. Anyway. The other big uh, question, uh, comment I have is there are no state specific questions. We're talking about Rajasthan, which has had a free medicine scheme, which is a very interesting and significant scheme over more than a, nearly a decade. And through various, so along with 30, 35 generic questions, could we have had five state specific questions for Rajasthan, different questions. Gujarat, where PPPs have been very important, different questions. Tamil Nadu, where we have a state health insurance scheme of long standing, different questions. So state-specific questions should have also been added. Maybe these can be addressed in the next round. There's no question on government responsibility to regulate private hospitals. In the COVID epidemic, we saw a huge overcharging, massive exploitation of patients across the country. The government 
is not only responsible for running its own facilities, it's also responsible for regulating rent. 15 Indian states regulated rates for COVID care during the pandemic. That's also a responsibility which should have been asked about at least when we asked about. So the only question is about, do you support the government, you know, uh, giving you access to private hospitals through insurance? Which is okay. That is one check, one, one mode of public interaction with the private sector. But regulation of the private health sector is another. And at least one question on privatization of public health services. Do you think <laughs> that privatization, especially in Gujarat, you know, it could have been an important question. Where we have the so called Adani model of handing over public hospitals to private players. Not going to that city for this. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, I just wonder that instead of taking both UP and Bihar, if you have from the East taken Bengal, it should have been a very interesting. You know, UP and Bihar is okay. I mean, we know that they are very important politically, but <laughs> it's just a thing because Bengal has done some very interesting things in their own style. I'm not going into the details. Uh, on various fronts which are in the health sector, which could have been reflected. Anyway, now coming to the, so these are just some reflections on the, the report. Otherwise, I feel that the, the main findings need further unpacking and only qualitative information will allow us to do that unpacking. Otherwise, we'll, we have gone a few steps ahead, but we have not really gone into the full test of what is going on. I mean, please don't take this in a critical, you know, <laughs> as a critical comment, it's more as a, Reflection. So, for example, we know that not all health services become politically visible. Some particular health programs have a high political visibility, and some have a very low political. So, Mohalla clinics are highly political. PMJY highly political. NRHM. Aap gaon mein jaake wohi se puchiye. Aapko NRHM ke baare mein pata hai? I don't think anybody will tell. I mean, this is, this is a huge program, much larger and probably on the whole more impactful than many other, you know, no, no political visibility. So we need to also, you know, in a, in, in a study, we need to ask people which specific change, either positive or negative, or which specific facility do you feel has improved? Rather than asking a generic question, have health services improved? Which specific, and your own experience, not just hearsay, you know. So, uh, and there's a narrative around, <laughs> you know, uh, certain services or certain entitlements. Arogeshri is from Arogeshri to PMK, you know, the narratives have been built around certain things, you know, certain kinds of services. So, visible improvement in local availability or access, especially newly created access, has high political visibility. And strengthening of systems, supply side improvements have low political visibility because they need extremely important. We have hired so many ASHA, we have engaged so many health workers, we have put in so many thousands of crores. Not for <laughs> So I'm just pointing out that we need to unpack these, these dynamics when we do this kind of study. And um, then, I mean, we also need to reflect what constricts the health policy vision of all political parties in this country. And why is health not becoming the kind of prime agenda that it needs to become, I suppose. Many of us will agree with that. And here, there are a few structural factors. It's not just a subjective sort of thing, you know, all these politicians, they don't understand that. I mean, they may or may not, <laughs> but it's not just, you know, there are certain structural factors which prevent health or retard health from becoming a full project political agenda. The first is what I call bounded rationality, that there is a very limited understanding of how health systems function among <laughs> political parties, and there's a short-termism, which means five years is the maximum time horizon in which any political party plans. If they plan for five years, it would be great, I think. Uh, Yogendra Ji will probably tell us it's not even five years. <laughs> but I mean, it's going So with this kind of short-termism, you don't look at huge system improvements and transformations. You only look at short-term. Second is diffuse public support versus concentrated private opposition. Diffuse public support, if you want to regulate private hospitals in this country, we have 10 lakh allopathic doctors and 135 crore ordinary people. So who is more influential? Obviously the doctors. <laughs> so diffuse public support does not is not sufficient to counter concentrated private opposition. That's why the Clinical Establishment Act in this country for the last 12 years has not been implemented. And there are many other examples. Today in Rajasthan, the Right to Health Act 
Metro Healthcare Act is being opposed by a small section, but it is quite influential. So this, this point also needs to be dealt with. That is, of course, fiscal constraints, the overall neoliberal framework in which all kinds of budgetary constraints are imposed. And this leads to self-censorship among public actors and among public officials. Self-censorship means before you suggest something to your boss, you first edit it out. Anything which is going to require more points goes into the third way. And you only you know, present for technical proposals which are politically acceptable because they don't cost much money. This is also a significant issue which we have faced. And reluctance to involve people as central product protagonists in health services to make a take an approach of co-production of health. I think this has also been a big drawback from Thailand uh, to the NHS. Wherever public health services and programs are functioned, when people have become partners in some sense. Today in the UK, if anybody tries to privatize NHS, there will be a huge you know, outcry. So because people are involved. And if people get involved in the process of delivery and in the process of organization of health services, it will become a problem. <laughs> so these are just a few uh, kind of reflections. And then finally, I would just like to say, talk about when we talk about health in our democracy, we also have to talk about health of our <laughs> health of our democracy. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. So I won't go into the gory details, but we, <laughs> but we have seen something very peculiar right now. You see, there is a trajectory which we expected that health services from being an issue of clientelism, you know what I mean, that Sarpanji will, you know, get us access to the some medicines, or our corporator in the, you know, local will get us access to some care. This kind of clientelism was expected to move in the direction of universalism on the road of rights, and this is what was initiated under UPA one to a certain extent. It did not happen. I mean, as the, the trajectory was not completely completed, but the road of rights leads from clientelism to universalism. And universal access. And somewhere, instead of taking the left turn, we took the right turn. And then what happened is that basically, instead of moving towards universalization, we moved towards commodity and leave this to the market and let it be an individual uh, kind of affair. And, and even if we are giving health insurance coverage, it will not be comprehensive, it will not be for the entire population. It will be some services for some people, some of the time. <laughs> Not all services for all people, all of the time. And this completely, you know, runs the entire, you know, um, sort of political profile of, of health anxiety. So I just like to sort of uh, posit that health. Uh, uh, so, and now people vote based on emotion, primarily, and secondly on logic. <laughs> so, uh, it's not enough just to tell people that you services. Something more has to be done. People have to, uh, you know, emotionally relate to the provision of services as something extremely important for their lives. Something which is life-saving. Something which makes a basic difference in, in your life. We have to present and translate health issues into something which becomes not just rational, but also emotional. I mean, this is, I mean, just a reflection which I'm <laughs> sort of sharing with you as an activist. And to conclude with, if we want health to become a political issue in this country, we will need a new politics of health. I'm saying this as a health activist, <laughs> and I don't have the time to go into what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to imply, but maybe we can you know, go to that a little bit in the discussion, which links people's lived experiences with political, realistic political proposals for health system change. So if we leave out one of these, we are missing the boat. So if we only focus on people's lived experiences, we come to a very, very minimalistic kind of thing. Okay, let's give some free medicines, let's give some access to healthcare. And if you only focus on health system transformation, we leave out people really. So um, when we are able to bridge these two people's lived experiences with the kind of health system transformation which are required and create a language which can uh, integrate these two, you will have a politics of health which will make them genuinely into a political issue. Thanks. Thank you so much.
thank you very much, um, Abe. And I think with that, I'm going to immediately turn to Jacques Rao, um, who I think may be able to start to unpack where they left us, which is as someone who has worked at the heart of government, um, obviously as former Union Secretary of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, um, and someone to whom I hope you've given some answer to your book, entitled Do We Care in <laughs> this health system? Yes, I think. We do care. Yeah. Um, not enough. Yes. Um, so I, I'd like to make some comments and pick up from another. Thank you. Uh, I think that was a very really powerful presentation. I think we all agree with me on that. Um, but you know, I'd like to start with the story and focus on is the health the political electoral issue at all? And uh, my thoughts go back to when uh, while our chief executive was our chief minister now the debate. And uh, he then, I was also part of the system at that time of health. And there was a lot of discussion on, because he was a doctor, and a lot of uh, requests, most of the requests that used to get out, and he said almost 30 to 40 percent of the petitions he received were from poor people saying, please give us some money from your seems we need funds for a surgery for my child, for my father, for something. And being a doctor, he was naturally very sensitive to this. So he, he was very keen that we should step in with the social health insurance program. At that time, Dr. Devi Shetty uh, collaborated with the government of Karnataka and came up with the scheme, scheme under which the farmer cooperatives uh, had a program for the farmers. Uh, through a health insurance uh, program, uh, uh, scheme. So he had that problem. There was some amount of advocacy from Dr. Shetty. There was also some amount of, at that time, ICICI also did a universal health insurance program in Assam, which meant a block grant was given by the government of Assam to ICICI until everybody was covered with insurance. So there was some lobbying from the bank too. But he saw that you know, this ICICI was a pretty bonus program because by the time somebody got sick and the number of forms that had to be filled and the certificate that had to be obtained to get that reimbursement of the expenditure, that poor man, besides the disease, would have been dead with that. So he said, This is not workable and it did not work. I don't think anyone in the SAM for any benefit, it was just to pay out to, to the bank. But he was interested in what. Uh, the, the Karnataka scheme was. So he was pushing towards uh, that, and that's how the Arogya Shreem, the first government sponsored health insurance program, was merged in Andhra Pradesh, which covered 85% of the population. That was because he said all white Russian card holders and given our anti corrupt system, everybody was covered as poor. So 85%. <laughs> In that fifth state of Andhra Pradesh were declared poor, that they all had five Russian cards. So they were all eligible for this program. Now, the story that went uh, is that he won handsomely in the following election, and uh, the, the Congress party uh, uh, believed very strongly that at least there was a 5% swing in votes because of this uh, program. And I have also visited villages, talked to interact with people, and I said, why, what was attractive? They said, the fact that tomorrow if we fall sick, we don't have to beg, borrow, or steal money, and that the state will take care of our expenses. That sense of security that people got made a huge psychological impact. So, you know, now when it comes to voting, of course, this is not the determining factor why he was elected, but it was one of the perception matters a lot. So it was not whether he put up a new hospital or whether he, he uh, put up more medical colleges or anything of the kind, but the perception that at a time when there was absolute impoverishment on account of health, there was this chief minister who said, you go to a hospital and I pay for you. So and that was two lakhs of rupees at that time. And that's a, that's a pretty strong program. The second uh, uh, perception, the second big uh, impact that program made was he had opened up private hospitals also. So for the first time, a rickshaw puller, who, could, who probably has dropped many patients at 
the doorstep of Apollo Hospitals and all, never then that he could enter, could walk in and get his appendicitis of the Sangha. Now that was a huge uh, bridging of a class divide, if I might put it in those terms, uh, that a poor person uh, could really walk into even a corporate hospital, which was completely out of his uh, radar till now, was accessible to him. So these had, you know, so the entire, what I'm trying to persuade you to think is that voting is never because of this theme or because of that theme. It is a perception. What is the overall perception that you're creating in the mind's eye? If you really ask me, what would, particularly Namdha Telangana, the former Andhra state, what really drives a voter to vote for a party is cash. <laughs> as cynically simple as that. And there was an interview in the paper who said, we never, uh, not in the TV, in a recent by-election, and uh, they said, uh, what did you, who did you vote for? They said, they didn't vote for Congress, but they didn't get any money. <laughs> <laughs> this fellows get 5,000, this party gave us 6,000, so we voted for them. So, you know, and now you, we all laugh at it, but at the election time, a poor family makes almost close to 40,000 rupees. So they're five votes or so, and it's a real. So they look at it as these politicians, they make the money. We what do we get? They see it's only once in five years, so get the best out of that. So now this is a very, very, very big cynical little bit it's not out of voting vote, but that's not what we're discussing today. <laughs> but if we come back to the fact that what kind of policies and what kind of issues really lay on their mind, and I think on health. The story of uh, uh, Vaisad, uh, the Arugishi was uh, so powerful that the, the that you know this triggered several states to then come up with a exactly similar replica of the Vaisad program. Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. Now I don't know how many states. Almost within a span of three or four years, almost twelve to fifteen states had government-sponsored health insurance programs based on a design model that Amra has set up, including the latest one of Ayushman Bharat, the entire structure of the program, the software, the IT, everything was taken from Andhra Pradesh. So that means, you know, it was an extraordinary foresight, I would say, of a political leader at the time to really be able to understand the pulse of the people and say, this is what matters to the people. And this is what uh, is uh, health all about. Now, therefore, you also know that health is an extremely political issue. It doesn't have to be more political. It's a highly political issue. But it's not in the electoral politics, is, it? is what we are now talking about. The second, coming to today, I am very optimistic, and I do think that slowly we are edging uh, from health being an extremely neglected sector uh, in, in our development dialogue and the public discourse to becoming an electoral issue when I hear Mr. Kejriwal going to every state saying, I promise you good things in the hospital and people responding. Now, the beauty of the Mohalla clinics was that it was placed the locational factor of the Mohalla clinic right in the midst of the people, the poor people who live matter. Had he opened these 100 clinics anywhere where he had land and and where it is convenient and on the on the you know roadside or something like that, it may not have had any impact because we have enough facilities like that. But this is in the midst of the slum where people could step out of the house and walk in and get a whole range of services free of cost. So that made a huge impact on, on again the fact that they didn't have to go to the hospital, wait in the for the OP ticket, wait for the whole day lost. I mean, that's a lot of money for the poor person, a one-day loss means the wage loss. And uh, so, you know, it, it has monetary uh, implications for somebody who has to spend a lot of time on getting access to health care services. So the Mohalla Clinic now has been replicated in many states in, around the country. We have to be called in Gavathana and Hyderabad and so on and so forth. But the popularity of this model, the very fact it got replicated so quickly, shows that the politicians saw an electoral advantage in pushing this program further. So, you know, I think when you look at programs and see are they getting replicated as the other states copying, in itself shows 
So the politicians are sensitive to what works and what doesn't work. And the fact that they are able to replicate, whether it's the insurance program, whether it's the Walla clinic and all, is because they know that it has made uh, uh, you know, a link with the, the people's aspirations and expectations, and therefore that the, the, the leadership is supportive of a policy uh, uh, that, that furthers their own electoral advantages. So these are the, the two things I would say in terms of broad comments on whether uh, is it getting electoral uh, advantage. And I think it's more and more, and you know, I credit Mr. Kajiwal for having put health on the table uh, because now we find Prime Minister Modi's kind of opening medical colleges and, you know, health is getting some mention. Uh, thank God, <laughs> we've been struggling for at least a footnote. And now we're finding ourselves as a bon paragraph. So, yeah. you know, it's a little promotion. So I think uh, um, this, this does all go well. But when you come down to, uh, you know, the fact that will it be sustained and will it uh, continue? How do we make it, you know, and I'm reminded another story of I was in Canada at the time uh, there were elections announced and the MP in the area where I was staying lost his election only because he gave the diagnostic center in his constituency to a private sector. And he lost it just on that. Now, that is because, and I think she will agree with me, because UK has similar uh, values. Canadians are extremely, extremely passionate about equality in care and the non-privatization and commercialization of health care. It's a very important constituency for them, as it is for UK, not the US. Now, we in our country don't really are not passionate about any values like that, that everyone should get equal care, whether it's rich or poor, everyone must get equal treatment. No, we are very happy with the hierarchy of class uh, uh, system, where the rich, of course, will go to a corporate hospital, but this poor man, this is more than enough. And the poor man also thinks that is enough, because I'm poor, it's okay, I've got a paracetamol in a puriya. That's okay, you know, that's what I deserve. So this kind of layered expectations across the income and social brackets also has an impact on how much the people push their own uh, uh, requirements onto the political uh, table and vice versa. So, uh, uh, but here you see that, you know, though the people have said that they, they blame the government or they, they think the government is responsible for their health care, yet there's not a whimper when so much of privatization is taking place. I mean, the district hospitals are proposed to be, they've already done it in about 19 cases. They want to hand it over to the private sector. And when they do that to the private sector, I'm not against private sector because I don't care uh, whether it's a private provider, GP sitting there doing primary care or hospital services and the government pays for it, I don't care as a patient. But when you begin to profiteer on health, it hurts. And these colleges, these district hospitals are going into hands of private sector, which are looking at it as a profit, as a business model to profiteer from it. That is the difference, not profit. Profit, everybody should make, even I made a profit when I was with the government because I earned a salary. So everyone, nobody's giving free services, not at all. But the point here is when you begin to profit here on it, no it's full well this cost 10, but I take 10 times more money, then that is that is where the ethical issue arises. And the kind of privatization that is uh, now, you know, that is the um, uh, policy today is something that uh, is being pushed back, I would say, because there was a scheme where Niti Ayo came up with the design that you know district hospitals will be divided and uh, the best part of the hospitals will be handed over to the private sector to set up, uh, invest money and set up for treating cardiac and and uh, uh, and cancer cases and uh, you know and accidents. Whereas the behind it will be the other services for uh, run by the government. Now you don't do that. You don't set up hospitals like that. But even that, then that was pushed back and I think they've given it up. But uh, this privatization of medical colleges, for example, I mean, this kind of giving, uh, having to pay two pros, three pros, four pros for an MBBS seat, for an MDC, 
is something that's creating huge distortion in the health system. That's the beginning root of the of the system that's happening. And and I believe me, every political party has its still has its hands in the till of furthering this privatization, commercialization of medical education. And even though everyone knows that commercial medical education is what is poisoning the health system in our country. So, you know, the, 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 these are issues which are very weighty issues which need to, the entire political economy needs to be studied when we say, can health become an electoral issue or not? Because how much do people understand the nuances of all the prioritizations that are being done, in, whether it's in budgetary allocation or whether it is in the policies that are being put in place and what are the lobbies that are working behind it, as I've beautifully put it, where is the lobby for people's health? Where is the lobby for free health care, which is really the duty of the government? Who's calling the government to account for uh, providing services which, is, which they're entitled to and which is the government's are duty bound to provide? You know, so this entire dialogue itself is missing because we don't have in our democratic system, democracy is equal to elections. But there are no democratic, democratization of health is not taking place because there is no stakeholder involvement while we're making policies or while we're making budgetary allocations or while we're discussing I mean, health is what we're discussing, but that goes for any policy, whether it's a state or the central level. Just calling a few civil society groups is not uh, uh, people's involvement. So Kerala, for example, since they've decentralized it and made panchayats responsible for health, there's a far greater democratization. It's very difficult for, though there is private sector, but they're held accountable, but it's very difficult to be able to hand over the entire primary care, shut down government to district hospitals, or uh, do any of those kind of policies because there is a certain stake in the whole uh, system and there's an ownership among the people in, in Kerala at the community level. We saw the kind of community involvement and engagement in COVID management. Otherwise, in this country, we would have had many more deaths. So, you know, unless and until there is a community and a stakeholder engagement, and health becomes a very important aspect of their, uh, uh, and they see an advantage in, in, uh, in uh, pushing for health and well being, it can never really be the pressure point for them to activate their own representatives and in turn make it an electoral uh, issue. So these are some of the opening comments that I had as far as the survey is concerned. Uh, though of course I agree with what Abhay has said, qualitative nuance uh, um, surveys are required because health is so complex and so intertwined. But uh, you know, as for your question at this now, and I think it's pretty good. You do ask a lot of, <laughs> a lot of important questions, but that those results of that have not been given. So, you know, uh, you can't blame us for saying that you're only quantitative, but the question, but once you begin to analyze all your assumptions, uh, there's several questions that are going to give you huge insight. And I think once you triangulate all that information and uh, juxtapose it with the state that you have done, I think, very interesting. So, and uh, that's, I think that we should see more on that. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Sudhat. And, and also just to note, we really see this as the beginning of a larger project. So um, absolutely to both your, both your points, there's much to run that. Um, but let me turn now to Henry Perry, um, who has, who is Professor of Economics by IT Delhi to start with, but who has spent decades researching service delivery in multi-dimensional areas of social policy, including health. Um, uh, I'll invite you to, to offer some preliminary reflections to reflect on yourself. Thank you. Um, this works, right? Um, okay. So, <laughs> the body that we broke was a little bit disappointed um, that I had to be as coherent as possible. So, first of all, I do want to say that I'm very conscious of the fact that there are people in the audience who understand elections and voting and mm -hmm. politics. <laughs> and on the other hand, there are 
people in the audience who understand health uh, much better, including obviously the because while uh, I do work a lot on uh, government health, uh, government provisioning of various forms of social support, health is the one area where we <coughs> fairly dipped our toes uh, into the water. Uh, so I have had the advantage of seeing a lot of health facilities across the country in the course of other surveys. So I have a sense of how to uh, work. And on the basis of this sort of very shaky ground on which I stand, I'm going to make some comments. So for me, I think the most uh, interesting finding in the survey was the fact that 80% of the respondents said that government uh, is responsible for the provision of healthcare. And I'll try to explain why I think it's so significant. Because uh, <laughs> at least in the more uh, privileged circles in policy making now, increasingly there is a capture of that space by entities that actually believe that private sector can provide the answer. And it's very refreshing and it's a reaffirming kind of finding that at least people don't think that way. Even amongst the economists, you know, as far back as 1963, Arrow wrote about the problem with relying on the private sector. And Arrow, by the way, got a Nobel uh, just to add weight <laughs> to the name. Uh, he had outlined very clearly why the health, sec health provisioning cannot come from the private sector. And, you know, when you, or very often, if you say something like this, or if I say something like this, people will roll their eyes and say, Ye to aise hi <laughs> like, so this is not really, a, you know, some sort of uh, ideological, uh, blind ideological position. It is a very well argued position, whether it is psychological or not, is besides the point. And I think after COVID, when we, people have seen how badly the private health sector worked from initially shutting the doors to patients and saying we won't let COVID patients come because our other patients will suffer to overcharging, to you know, all kinds of malpractices. And also simultaneously seeing by and large the inability of the state to discipline the private sector. People should really question themselves when they say, you know, this is just an ideological position without good uh, reason. There is very good reasoning for not allowing uh, unbridled private sector involvement, especially as Sujata was saying, when it is for profit. You know, there are countries like Germany and Japan, which have amongst the best health systems in the world, but we, where the provision is coming largely from private providers who are very strictly regulated. So for instance, the insurance funds in Germany are not for profit <coughs> insurance funds and they compete on volume. So the, their margins are really thin and they compete on volume. And so the more, the better deal they give to, their, uh, to the patients or the pool of people whom they insure, uh, the more people they are able to attract. And similarly in Japan, where also a lot of the provision is through the to private doctors, not like NHS. Uh, the state negotiates with the doctors prices down to, you know, if you have a one inch cut, then what is the price of sewing up that, uh, that wood? Yeah, so it is very strictly regulated. And of course, those are societies with high levels of education. So that kind of regulation actually has meaning on the ground. I'm of course partial to the NHS because I've experienced it myself and the direct provisioning both in India to some extent because at IIT we have uh, <clears throat> doctors who we can go and consult. So for all these reasons, I think that uh, finding of 80% thinking that this is a primarily a government responsibility is uh, quite important. And uh, like I said, in the past decade or so, perhaps actually not perhaps, even longer, <coughs> many years ago, I had some students at IIT Delhi who wanted to do a project with me and I asked them to do uh, an RTI. And in the RTI, they were asking the health ministry, who are the how many consultants do you have and who are your consultants paid by? 
and uh, Rama Nataraj from Tiger Hill actually did a story using those kinds of replies that we got. Um, and uh, there were at that time 200 or more than 200, close to 250 consultants in the ministry, paid not only by philanthropy like BMGF, but also paid by Deloitte, like private consulting firms like Deloitte, CPNG, etc. Now, when your PowerPoint presentation is made by a private consulting uh, consultant, who think about these issues very differently. They think about it as a business opportunity. Healthcare is not supposed to be a business opportunity. I've been talking about this earlier. Like we have commoditized healthcare, then actually it is, an, it is social consumption. It should be outside the sphere of the market, et cetera. So this has been happening probably incrementally. I don't know. I won't be dipped into these things once in a while. But right now it's pretty serious. Like I think Niti I so we won't even get an answer to an answer. Yeah, certainly I won't have to do it for something like this. So uh, I think these problems need to be also highlighted uh, a bit more. Uh, the happy part of the story, of course, is that state governments are seeing health uh, more as a political tool in like in terms of electoral gain. Um, I think in some states they're further ahead than in other states. But I think what's happening right now in the state of Rajasthan is really interesting because the general government brought a right to healthcare act. And uh, like, like it happened in the UK after the Second World War, uh, the private doctors and hospitals are opposing it tooth and nail. And at least the UK had weapons to like arms twist the doctors and uh, get them in line. I don't know if Rajasthan has uh, somebody like that to, to do the negotiation, the hard work of negotiating with doctors and you know to make them accept something like this. And this uh, all these changes reflect in the numbers as well. So I just pulled out a few uh, in uh, one interesting state uh, is also Chhattisgarh which has been working, I think, quite consistently for a, almost two decades, perhaps, where the proportion of people who say they don't go to a public facility has dropped from 64% to 30% over excessive NSSN rounds. Even in Rajasthan, it's gone from 35 to 26%. So the drop is less, but they were already, the people were already accessing the public sector there. Um, and these are reflected in NSS data as well. So the latest round is 2017-18 NSS 75th round. And in ho for hospitalization, for instance, in Chhattisgarh, nearly 60% said to go to health service. Uh, and this sort of ties with some of the points that have raised earlier that when you ask people, are you satisfied with healthcare? It, each one would be thinking of a very different thing. One person would be thinking of the subcenter she went to when she had a small injury on her toe while working in the field. Another person might be thinking about a hospitalization case that happened recently, right? So in both those things, both experiences and expectations might be quite different. Uh, so, so I think both like understand and similarly for you know what uh, Siddhartha was saying that people, you know, cynically she said people think about the money they get. I have not encountered people who say that, but quite surprisingly, I come from Gujarat. <laughs> Gujarat rich people have said to me, Mane maro vote nati I don't want to waste my I don't want to waste my vote. And so they try to guess who is going to win the election. And so they try to they want to vote for the party that way. Like such crazy logic, like who you would never imagine that voters are thinking about being on the winning side. Like, how does this matter? Who was I of getting to vote for who you think will further your agenda? But no, we want to be on the winning side and just say that I voted for the winning party. So then understanding why people vote and then further, like I think others have said this also, that it's not a unidimensional kind of decision. On the one hand, we might be thinking about caste, religion. Uh, like I want to be on the winning side, I want to see who's given me more cash. But on the other hand, they may have more lofty uh, thoughts like who's going to provide better education, etc. So 
Uh, I have not had the opportunity to see the first event, and I think a lot matters on how the the sequencing and then exactly how the questions were framed, etc. But uh, it's it's good that somebody is applying their mind to this pretty complex. Both healthcare is complex because it could go from a little stub on your toe to a hospitalization and voting. I'm like, I, I don't even know where to start as far as voting is concerned. Um, another sort of suggestion that I had with respect to what is already there, not what you might do in the future, and I would be bold for something this, is uh, to look at state wise patterns because, you know, I think Bihar and UP, okay, chalo, happy similar here because, I mean, judging from the second G data, but Tamil Nadu is very different in the sense of being an early starter, always having invested quite a bit in healthcare, <coughs> uh, public investment has been quite high. And then there's something like Rajasthan, where, like what we were saying, in 2011, they got they initiated free medicines, and then in 2013, he added free diagnostics just before the election, too close to the elections to be able to to capitalize on it in terms of electoral gain because the tests were not in place by the time the election happened in December 2013. And I think these free medicines and free diagnostics have happened in several other states. So I think the statewide contrast would be really illuminating, even within what you have, you know, there's always a long wish list on what more to include. But even within what you have doing further cross tabs would would really uh, quite a bit more. And then about voting, you know, uh, political priorities or uh, priorities at the time of voting. Uh, this is sort of, again, very general thought. Uh, see, I think that uh, Muddha Banana is, I don't think it's not as long as you look like uh, people, voters can. They would have to be organized, as he was saying, to make something on Muta. Now, the fact is that uh, both of them commented on the difficulties of building solidarities in India. Uh, Abhay talked about the difficulty of building solidarities between the healthy and the sick. Uh, Sujada talked about the problem of building solidarities across class groups. I would add uh, caste is another very important dimension that fractures. Uh, you know, this kind of consensus building. So, Muddha Kaun Banakar, I think uh, the people who make a Muddha in electoral times, again, I mean, I'm just saying this as a lay person, as an observer of politics, not as somebody who studies it, <coughs> is really the top 20 odd percent in the country, the elite. Yeah, and that includes state journalists. Right, our media people come from privileged classes. Their instinct is to think private vote, public bad. Right? Same thing amongst academics, bureaucrats, politicians. So this whole power elite, uh, which is numerically small, but in terms of in opinion making and <coughs> shaping policy, quite important. So in a sense, the survey is perhaps studying the wrong group. <laughs> it's the elite who need to be, you know, their brain need to be diagnosed. <laughs> um, and this, you know, this again, it comes up in elections also. <coughs> so if you think about, say, the UK one and UK two years, because I partly because I was in uh, Studying books in the early uh, for the, since 2002, mm -hmm. actually, I've been studying employment guarantee programs, and then also PTS was part of my PhD work. So I followed those very closely. But the UPA governments, they didn't do now there. Yeah, mm -hmm. To the extent that the Congress wanted to do now something, they decided to do now Aadhaar. <laughs> it's a team that has sabotaged almost any good program that they've got during their, uh, their term and is now sabotaging. <coughs> Similarly, and actually, Gehlut, I think, in recent years has started commenting on this. He said, okay, now you've understood 
Now you see no, what your daddy is not safe. Even there, he does not speak about what I would imagine is a people's issue. He speaks about different things. So he does not easily <laughs> talk about the urban employment guarantee scheme in Rajasthan, which kicked off like uh, last year in August or so, which is quite quite interesting, right? It came out of the COVID response and now is actually being implemented on the ground in small ways. But he'll talk about state health insurance, mm -hmm. which is less tangible for people to see. So you will find holdings in uh, cities in Rajasthan for the Indira, uh, Shari, Rosa, Yojana, I think it's called. Uh, so even politicians, I think because they are more privileged, <coughs> they, and I would say that they look, in my view, is one of those few chief minister who's more in touch with ground realities in his state and other chief ministers I know. I know of, not know. <laughs> uh, and yet he's not able to, uh, in my view, in my opinion, he he's prioritizing the wrong thing. <laughs> talking about chief political achievement. Um, so this class starts bias in what becomes a mutta. And I think it comes, it, it's a fallout of the way of our society being, you know, certain groups being overrepresented in the power elite. And then unless you make a change shape their thinking in a way, more conducive yeah, way, then it won't become a political <coughs> priority. Then when polit so you have to make politicians start talking about this. To make politicians start talking about it, I feel like the media has to start. And then when they when media will focus their attention on development issues, <laughs> this is a term that John uses a lot. Their tendency is to do drainage inspector report. You know, you know, in PDL, there's this kachra in NREJ, there's this kachra, you such a government hospital. What they don't talk about is the ones who are actually benefiting from these programs, whichever program it is. So they have to do both things. Both are their responsibilities. And I think their inability to talk enough about the positive and also the negative is partly this class cast kind of uh, privilege, whatever. So um, maybe I should stop with that, no? <laughs> then I'll send you my email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to do my best now to draw out a few of the themes that come across the responses that you've all made. And, and I hope to leave a little time in this question to the audience as well. Um, but, but to start, it, it seems to me that there's a puzzle here in what you've all said between the problem of political demand and the stuff. So, what becomes an election year? Who makes an election issue? And to what extent are citizens sufficiently literate? Um, able to articulate either how their own lived experience of the health system looks, but also to understand how the health system functions. And, and I wonder what the role is of different actors in intervening in that problem of political demand and between what voters demand and how they're able to demand it, and what politicians, political parties, the media, political society organisations, how those different actors frame health as, as an issue. Um, and, and how do we start to intervene in that problem of political demand and supply? And one way, and this is actually something that you haven't reflected on, and as somebody who spends much of their time thinking about federalism and multi-level governance, I'm afraid it is incumbent on me to bring this into the picture. That's the question of decentralization. So when we talk about the, when Sujata, you talked about the importance of community ownership and the health of and China's, yeah co-production um, of uh, how, you know, of, of, of how I think you've described I've the problem of translating lived experience or, or kind of bridging the gap between lived experience and system reforms. Panchayat's principle level governments clearly have a crucial role to play. One of the findings that I find fascinating, it's a small finding in the report, but one of the findings I find particularly fascinating is that more people attribute responsibility for health to their local and to the central. 
And most people correctly identify health as a state um, subject, and the state governments is primarily responsible for hospitals. But more people attribute responsibility to their local government, which has no constitutional role in, in health, than they do to the central government, which has arguably no constitutional role that plays, plays a big role in, in the health sector. Um, so how do we understand that? local attribution of responsibility. Why do so many voters in our survey seem to see health as both an issue? How, what, how might that be harnessed? Um, and how do we interpret our own findings? So, so um, one argument that, that we sort of to, to tease out is whether there is a degree of, of performance-based reward for state governments. So, so chief ministers seem to Receive both the credit and some electoral reward for health, perceived health system improvements. But among those people who are less satisfied with the survey, they're more likely to hold local government responsible. So are we seeing deflection of blame at the moment um, for areas of weaker performance to the local level? Why might that be? And what do we what could be done with that um, very localized understanding of, of, of health? So I'd be fascinated to hear your, I mean, your understanding of why, why that might be the case. Um, another um, question I wanted to ask you to reflect on, you've all talked in different ways about the, the, the drivers of commercialization, the privatization, the role of privatization. Um, and I wondered whether there is something in the, the electoral dynamic that is um, So. Uh, so, Jata, you've talked about, about why Assad, the origin of health insurance, and the perception that there was enough of an electoral advantage um, that you know, 12, 14 other states also implemented state level health insurance programs, and of course, the, the union government um, after 2014 introduced Ocean and um, And it's fairly heavily promoted Ocean and you know, it's, it's a it's a this scheme. So clearly, I would imagine that there is some perception that there's an electoral payout here. But of course, health insurance schemes themselves are part of a landscape of commercialization that is enabling access, um, I mean, depending on how they're designed, to privately um, health care. So is there something about what sells in electoral that is driving a particular direction of health system development? Um, is one question. The other is a question about schemes versus systemic reforms. Um, and clearly what tends to be sold in elections are schemes. Um, so whether it's PNJY, whether it's Mahala, I mean, we could argue about whether Mahala clinics are schemes or, or systemic reforms, but the packageable, tangible goods that can, you know, kind of demonstrable are, you know, are, are um, Things that can be you know, recognised easily by by voters and owned by by um, political parties, and I, you know, I think we see the same with the increased prominence of DPTs of direct benefit transfers. These are kind of, you know, direct, tangible transfers. This, in the case of DPT, the individualised transfers. Um, so, what does the preeminence of schemes do to system thinking um, and? Um, what, what is feasible um, in, in politicians' minds um, as, as policy reforms. There's one, I think, optimistic reading of what we show in this report, which is that at the moment, there seems to be relatively high level of, relatively high level of satisfaction with the health. Now, we could argue that just the kind of status quo and acquiescence, that it's a product of, of low expectations breeding, High satisfaction. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. but, um, but, but you, you could also argue that actually what we're not, what we don't show in this report is a high latent level of dissatisfaction. Of, you know, that, that there's not a protest vote around that. So, you know, politicians, you know, um, incumbent governments could take some part in that to think, well, actually, you know, this is a moment in which harder less of you know more difficult system reforms are feasible and could even be part of, of a political platform that that sought to I don't know I suppose fill out what I think you've all 
why it's identified as a kind of ideological boring around hell. Um, that you know, doing so may not at the moment um, be as much of a political risk as I think is sometimes thought. So, um, you know, we often hear that um, you know health is a is a difficult um, policy area to reform because of the you know the kind of essentially long term nature of the kind of you know, the difficult nature of the, of the systemic reforms which are required. <coughs> You know, is, is there a way of changing the frame of that? What's possible based on on the kind of data we have here? Um, and perhaps a, a final question. Um, Rita, you ended by mentioning PDFs, um, and I I wonder, and, and also the, the the elite bias, which shapes become you know what what what, what become electoral issues. And I wonder there whether there are lessons that you might draw, and perhaps this is a question you could reflect on, particularly given your involvement with the right to food movement, from what happened with the right to food to the right to health. Because there were also coalitions, obviously very strong coalitions um, of uh, you know, private interests that mobilized um, against a right to food. Um, and yet, eventually, the National Food Security Act was passed to very tumultuous um, conclusions with its passage. But okay. are there lessons to learn from how that's possible with the right to food that might be transferable to the right to health? Um, so, um, I, I'll invite each of you to pick from those comments what you would like to respond to in a few minutes. And then I'd like to leave a little bit of time as well to take a round of questions from. The floor. Um, so, have a question to you first. Okay. Um, there's so many issues which have been on the floor so now. <laughs> My able study report and also the panel, and I think you, the credit goes to you to provoking us <laughs> to think. Yeah, I mean, we had not maybe thought about some of these things in that context. At least I can still for myself. So, um, I'll just comment on maybe a couple of these. Reflection of grain to the local level. I think you briefly mentioned in the report. Mm. People access health services. I mean, poor people in urban areas, in rural areas, through client, clientelistic networks. Mm. You know, so there is a local sub-punch, there is a local corporator, or there is some other whatever influential person who helps them, especially in more serious cities. You know, to get that care which they require. He'll take the person to the hospital or talk to the doctor or whatever, exercise some political, uh, you know, pressure, whatever, and sort of because he needs that those votes, you know. <laughs> so, so he has a, a, a circle of influence and client, you know, client base. If that person fails to do this, then people will first of all blame, you know, the local politician. So it is possible that they had a bad experience in being able to access care. The local politicians either did not help them. Or failed to help them. <laughs> they tried and failed to help them, and this was an anger which was expressed against the local politicians. And I mean, I'm, I'm just speculating. You have actually mentioned something like, this, uh, but I'm just spelling it out. Okay. 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 <laughs> so, so that is probably one reason for this reflection of blame uh, to the local level. And uh, then you ask me, is there something in the electoral dynamic itself that drives privatization? And um, what sells electorally? Does privatization sell more electorally? <laughs> My hunch is people are largely agnostic to the source of service. They are interested in free, good quality services, which are assured. That is the bottom line. So if it comes through a Morna clinic, which is publicly organized, there. If it comes through a health insurance scheme, which is largely private provided, then also they are reasonably happy. So it is not that privatization alone will sell. Actually, reshaping people's imagination about where to expect a service to come from is a responsibility of the government. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, like the Thai entire experience of the 30 part scheme, when the, you know, the political party, the, you know, Thaksin's party said that everything will be treated with 30 baht, uh, he was not talking about public or private, but he was telling people that you will get free care or you will get highly subsidized care. And that is what he really reached out to people. Then the back, back office, you know, management was public health system, private providers putting them together, how to manage insurance, all that was the back office. The front office was you will get free care. And that is what actually matters for people. So I think it is not that privatization alone sells, 
if a robot is able to convince him, like the pre medicine team, like normal corona clinics, like what Tamil Nadu has done to a certain extent, Kerala has done to a certain extent, if good quality, free, accessible public health services are put on the political agenda by political parties, people will also go for that. But in the absence of that, uh, we have this kind of discourse here, you know, where uh, is certain neoliberal parties are, you know, will be more prone to sort of say that, you know, we will be. Incidentally, that logic does impact some of our parties. Like, remember, KZ was saying, our Sarkari hospital, private hospital, is next year. Now, what does this mean? <laughs> it means that, you know, somewhere the background understanding of the private hospitals are very good. And public hospitals are not so good, but you will improve the public hospitals so that people are good. <laughs> so, so, this is a this is 70 years of privatization of healthcare in this country has brought people's consciousness to this level, but it's not something that will necessarily remain like that. A strong public health, um, you know, proposal, set of proposals, right to healthcare for all, and a, a single health system for everybody, you know, which will not leave anyone out, which will not leave anyone behind. Those kind of proposals can gain traction. This is my hunch, if they're really presented well. Otherwise, we'll be left with let, let, let be a third point about schemes versus systemic reforms, which is very interesting. And that is where I think uh, a very simple job needs to be done, where um, certain, perhaps in public perception, A, B, C, you'll get free medicines, you'll get free diagnostics, you'll get free hospitalization care, and you'll get whatever, X, Y, Z. This is what you're going to get. This is the, the system. Now, behind that, the system reforms which need to be done is something which the bureaucrats, the politicians, and the public health experts need to work out. When it's presented to the same people, it cannot just be we are doing a health system reform. Sorry, nobody's interested. We are doing a national health mission. Sorry, nobody's interested. Huh? That is why the Congress failed to, in, instead of saying we, we have a direct check, they should have said we are ensuring guaranteed health services at, in every primary health center. And you will get these 20 services, which is something we have tried to push at that time. Unfortunately, that guaranteed health services fell off the map. <laughs> if Sujata must be remembering it, it was there in the initial analysis draft. So people need to, uh, you know, plug into concrete entitlements. But to support those concrete entitlements, system changes need to be managed in a more comprehensive way. So this is the tension which is there. But I think it, it can be managed I mean, and it can be politically uh, negotiated. And your last point, there is no protest uh, on health is not entirely true. In Maharashtra, we saw that in, in the peak of the COVID epidemic, a huge overcharging was taking place in private hospitals. We organized Santap Sabhas in some cities where COVID widows, women who had lost their husbands to COVID and who had mandated up with debts of 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 15 lakhs, 20 lakh rupees, and who had no means of paying that those debts, because you can imagine that, you know, became an issue. And the political party, which was in power at that time, uh, it responded. Because they could see the discontent on the ground and they acted and they, they we worked with them to do an audit and refund of you know excess charges from private hospitals, something completely unique. So an epidemic can be a portal for change. An epidemic can, you know, actions taken during the epidemic to regulate private hospitals rates can become an idea which uh, does not you know disappear. <laughs> I'm just giving an example. Uh, the discontent is there, it has to be channelized, it has to be focused, and it has to be converted into positive. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a and I will have, we will have a few minutes for questions at the end, so I will come to you. Um, there's nothing one can really add in a very significant manner after a very complex response. But I'm a bit intrigued by that uh, pe pe uh, people blaming the local government. Because except in Kerala and a little bit in Karnataka, there is really no association of <clears throat> local government with healthcare in, in people's mind and you know, also in policy. You know? So state government, yes. And uh, now the central government tries to take, because they, are, they take 60% of the uh, schemes that we are implementing, they say that the common, so you know, you know uh, the credit uh, sharing, the politics of credit distribution between center and state, those are going on particularly well. Uh, but then uh, the people do associate healthcare with uh, much more largely with the state government because they they look at who is the government. For them, it's a doctor, it's a facility. 
and the entire delivery of central sponsored schemes are also done through the state government. So therefore, the association uh, comes in and the blame of the credit goes to the state government. That I, think. I think that's how it should be. Except, you know, in the vaccination, the state government goes to ah, but the central government put the PM smoker and the state credit. So there is, there is this credit politics going on where the, the, the state minister, the state chief minister is very really angry, saying it's our money is also involved and we are the ones who have been standing on the line giving vaccination here and night to the people and uh, you have taken the credit. So, you know, this, this business is kind of going on, but uh, definitely, yes, uh, state governments are associated. <coughs> and so far as insurance driving, I mean, I would, you know, I think this is a really framed it very well. It's really a class issue. And in India, unfortunately, the middle classes and the rich classes have walked away from both health and education. They are not. They have made their own arrangements. The very rich will go to UK for treatment. Uh, the not so rich will hang on to the public hospitals. And the rest of them do with other private hospitals. And the same thing with schools. No middle class person goes to a government school. So therefore, uh, you know, once they're out and your your influencers or policy making are this little group through the media, they're the same class. All the media is also the same class. And uh, so when this new dynamics come in, for them, they're not bothered about public health or public school. That's a tragedy, which didn't happen in post -sec Second World War, but that's a tragedy that has happened in India. So there's really no stake, and that's the reason why both education and health for the majority of India continues to be, is because the policy makers are not interested uh, in, in furthering the world. And always there's a big pandemic, and yes, that too. Okay. So then, of course, they make a lot of noise, but but post that, you see, after such a traumatic pandemic, what they have budgeted, that's, uh, that is uh, uh, a political uh, signal given. Now, schemes are easy to sell, as, as I think she or you rightly put it, five year time frame. And, uh, and you know, health is so contentious. And uh, the, the result that any reform, any way you want to bring in, they will get pushed back from that particular lobby. And uh, th therefore, their whole understanding of health reform also, in my opinion, is very poor. Uh, they think in terms of only what the CII, these are the lobbies for the private corporate sector. In every committee, whether it's a 50 finance commission, whether it's, wherever it is, it's only the five corporate hospital chain owners who represent the so-called private sector. Whereas the private sector is not these people, they hardly cater to 4% of the care in India. <coughs> the large private sector is the middle level hospitals, the, the humble nursing home of some doctor mm -hmm. whose grandfather was a doctor and he inherited this hospital. Now, these middle level private hospitals are the ones who really are providing the bulk of health care for people at relatively affordable cost, you know. They're not exploitative, they're, they're relatively and pretty good. Now, their voice is not heard, and they hate the corporate sector people because they say there's so many problems with the Clinical Establishment Act, for example, or whatever. You know, let's take an example fire system has to be modern with sprinklers. Now, this guy inherited his grandfather's hospital, which is 80 years old. There were no earthquakes so those days. And uh, now, how do they put, uh, make it earthquake proof or put sprinklers? That will mean an investment of three crores, the whole income is hardly 40. You know, these kind of issues uh, do come in our rules, regulations, are so guided by what the corporate sector is doing, which is again fun, uh, uh, on the advice of McKinsey. <laughs> so, you know, this entire consulting firm that gives the model of what a good hospital is supposed to be. So, this, uh, uh, I see a completely asymmetry conversation that's going on. And uh, and does not really at this stage. So so that's I think one of the reasons why uh, the long term reform is not taking off. So we know what our problems are, but the sequencing of what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and uh, how do you ally the opposition <coughs> to it? I mean that kind of uh, strength of the political system and moves has to be done. And I'll just end with another point that we can. You know there is a scheme. Uh, I mean, 
this satisfaction that medical doctors don't go to primary healthcare center. Now the way is we won't go into why. So Chhattisgarh and Assam, they all came up with a three-year trained doctor who did who learned medicine the way all MBBS doctors do minus surgery. And he has a procedure. So that guy was more than enough for manning a primary health care center because even a MD medicine in primary health care center can do nothing for this dear trained fellow because he needs to operation table, he needs dialysis, and so on, one of them. So he was more than adequate for dealing with the primary problems in these remote areas where an MD doctor was going. Now, this is immensely popular for the politicians because they were able to address the presence of a well-trained uh, I mean, medical doctor in halfway medical doctor in that sense uh, and post him in the center. And West Bengal brought an act also um, to make this regular. But this was, you know, and then the government of India said we make it the national thing. So uh, that you, you can appoint these people. In my presence, my minister, for every chief minister that found me, 28 states, every health minister held a meeting and they all unanimously said we want this. We have a huge shortage of doctors. We don't, and these entity doctors are not going. Punishing is not the way to do so. We are not able to afford paying them much more money than they would. Even then, they don't go. So, this is the best why we give for a short term. In a democratic way, a cabinet secretary of health, uh, Ministry of Health, with the consensus of the entire uh, you know, political representatives of the state, we could not push through this because the lobby of the INA, which simply represented by five members of parliament, they went to the PM and did whatever they did, and you were told put the five back in the back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is democracy? What is that? government, where is the responsibility? These are sort of issues that arise that even what <laughs> you think is an important thing, you're not able to get a pushback because of the power of the president. Yeah. So, there's a yeah. 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 Quick response. Yeah, quick response. I guess, 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 I of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if I understood you correctly, you said that when they hold the center of state government responsible for provision of healthcare, but when things go wrong, they blame the local government. So I, this is based slightly on impressionistic uh, uh, information. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can see some panic. <laughs> so in July, we did a survey of public health facilities in five or six states. And my impression is that at the lower level, sub-center and PHP in most states, maybe not some do, there isn't any rationing of health services. Like, in fact, we thought they were being underutilized, grossly underutilized. There's a lot of facilities, but not enough patients showing up there. The rationing comes when that person is in a serious situation and needs to be taken either to the CSC or to the district hospital, that's where this access, you know, knowing people, et cetera, will matter. So your hypothesis, I'm not sure. For me, I think what could possibly explain it is that people hold central and state government responsible for policy design, and then they hold the local government responsible for policy implementation. And then sometimes in other schemes, they say center to be that state to be that young people come in. That here at the local level, in my panchayat or at the city shop or at the block level, people are corrupt or incompetent or whatever it is. So it could be partly that, you know, that this policy design is all right, but the responsibility of implementation surely has to be, you know, at the local level. That was one thing. And then the second thing you asked about this right to code. See, in the case of NRDG, all these people's groups work really hard to make it a political issue, right? It started in Rajasthan with the drought situation there, using the example of Maharashtra's employment directly scheme and the law that came there. And then Yellow at that time said, boss, I can't do this, go to the central government. And so the Congress at that time in 2004, they thought they would ever be close to winning an election. They said, 
result of manifesto. <laughs> so they put it in the manifesto and then somehow they then they have to deliver on it. But they were also compelled to deliver on that promise because it was in the uh, you know that you know, common minimum program of the left party zone. In the 2009 election, we expected or rather hoped that you know healthcare would be the next that the right to healthcare would become the big issue. But I don't know what the people were thinking before the food right to food act. So then of course that now that this political opening has come, you just grab what you and that's what you were thinking. Um, hey, kar se ko hai, so isko to bak, oh, like you know, let's not let go of this opportunity. So this again to me is the reflection of the kind of disconnect between the power really, the ruling classes and people <coughs> being unable to understand. But what is really, you know, so if you want to do healthcare, I would again like if you take the example of a lot of schemes, insurance is good, but you know that insurance is good for tertiary care, right? A lot of the time is for tertiary care. Not everyone wants tertiary care. What they want on a day to day basis is like blood tests. So, in that sense, what Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh have done to make free diagnostics and free medicine. Prioritize that over so the health insurance was sensible, right? You strengthen your primary base, uh, work, focus on preventive rather than curative. Don't wait for a cut to become gangrenous, requiring uh, amputation, and say, "Ah, look, we we gave you money to amputate. Uh, you should have actually, checked, you know, kicked in your services should have kicked in at the lower level." So then I think it's like I don't know what they're thinking. I don't talk to political parties or people in that much. So it's hard for me to understand what makes them put something in their manifesto. Thank you. Let, let's take... I'm being told I should close. <laughs> <laughs> I think our right to food might need to come first because there's been a waiting for us. But what I would say is if you have a burning question, please come and talk to us over food. Out in the lobby. Okay. Um, we will have a call. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Let's let's hold it. But um, we'd be very happy to talk afterwards because I know that there is a lot of interest in the subject in the room. So let me just um, for now thank hugely our panel for such um, insightful. <laughs> thank you.